Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I've just said good afternoon because it's very bright here. In Spain, we have changed the, they have switched the, the, the time to summertime, and now it's very, very clear. So good, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this third uh, webinar on a project work in preparatory education. Uh, I don't know if you've been to the to the two first uh, seminars, or the two previous seminars, sorry, that we have uh, already done. Uh, the first one was about what was uh, working through projects. The second one was uh, projects assessment. And today we're going to talk about creating independent thinkers uh, in CLIL projects in pre-primary education, right? Uh, if you have any question, you can just write them on the chat box uh, at any time, or just you can use the the raise it the raising hand uh, tool that you have on top of your screen so or you can leave them for the end of the session as you prefer okay right okay there we go right um is anybody of you already teaching through projects at infant stage at the primary or even infant stage or you've never th uh, taught uh, a work through project Let me see your answers. Thank you, Gino. Yes, I don't know why I was listening. So Gino is already working through projects with uh, very young learners, right? OK. Anybody else is working through projects right at the moment? Or you are completely new in the projects world? Primary and secondary. Oh, good. Great. So this, this is going to be a little bit uh, uh, lower as regards the level than your primary students, but maybe there are some ideas you can you can get for them because we are going to go through Bloom's taxonomy uh, and and see how we can apply creative thinking into project work. Okay, Jessica, in the future, all right, great. So I hope that this is uh, this uh, webinar could be of any use for you, Jessica, or at least to have something some uh, something clear in mind about uh, how to work creative thinking with very young learners, all right? Right. Um, if, um, especially Gino, who is the one who is already working through projects, what is your, the main problem when you have to work through projects with your students? Is there, there a number of students you have in the group or lack of cooperation with your colleagues, lack of resources, you don't have a lot of time for preparation? What is the main problem? All of them, a little bit of everything. What is the main problem you have or you find when having to work through projects? Large group of students sometimes, okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, Maria Jose. Welcome. In my case, all of them, all right. <laughs> this is why I told you you can choose all of them. Lack of resources and no time for preparation. All right. So yeah, the, the main problem with um, project work is that project work is not based on, on books normally, right, usually. So, um, and teachers, we have to create lots of materials and resources, not only for teaching and showing students, but also uh, sometimes to give them something to produce, all right? Uh, Gino says that most of the time teenagers enjoy working with projects. They are more engaged with clear lessons and language lessons. Yeah, I know, because here comes the positive uh, aspect of projects is that, however, on, on the one side, you can it can be some um, uh, time consuming and a bit demanding uh, for the teachers. Project work is very good for, for students. They absolutely love working through projects because they learn more. They, le they learn better and they have to cooperate in order to uh, carry out the whole class project, okay? So we're going to see some ideas on, on, on how we can uh, handle all these problems of uh, the lack of cooperation with colleagues, the uh, problems with big groups, uh, lack of resources, uh, no time for preparation, etc., etc. Right. So uh, I'm going to make a quick summary uh, of uh, the webinars we have done previously to this one in which we saw the, the three phases of the project work. The first phase was planning, that is, it's very important that before starting any project, as we always do in, in a normal lesson, we have to plan it. And project work requires a lot of planning in advance because since there is not a, a, a textbook, you, you have to follow uh, um, strictly to the letter. 
you need to plan a lot of different things, not only the resources and materials you're going to need, but also the aims, the objectives, the outcomes, uh, the teaching methodologies you're going to use, etc., etc. right? So planning in project work is very, very important. Then the second one is, sorry, the project development. That is, once everything has been planned and you have more or less everything controlled regarding the resources and everything, and even the tasks you're going to, to, uh, uh, to suggest your students to do, it's the moment to develop the whole project from the beginning to the end. What is the problem with the projects? That usually we never go from the beginning to the end of the project. Project work is a spiral kind of work, okay? Because you always know where you start, but you never know where you're going to finish. And in fact, projects can go through different paths. And it is very, very common also that from one project, you can create or start a new project. So the good thing about project work is, it, is that, it's, that it is very flexible because you can, you can go through different paths depending on the student's demand, uh, demand sorry, and the content you work, etc. Right? And the third and last step would be the assessment of the project. Okay? Project assessment cannot be a test based. Uh, so testing cannot, uh, it is almost impossible in project work because uh, most of the time what is most important in project work is the process of carrying out the different tasks in order to fulfill the whole project more than the final product itself, all right? And then the kind of production that students do or, or do and make, because sometimes they do and sometimes they make throughout the, the development of the project uh, are very important to, to uh, bear in mind for assessment, right? And this is why I say that not only a test-based assessment is recommendable because uh, sometimes uh, through a text you cannot reflect uh, in your assessment what your children or what your students have attained throughout the whole process of the uh, project work. Okay? So these are the three phases we have seen in, in our previous, in our previous uh, webinars. Uh, Gino says that due to the lack of time, I assess my learners with formative assessment most of the time. Mm, yeah, but the thing is, you can assess at the same time that the project goes on. You can do ongoing assessment by doing a, 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 by making a classroom observation. So what you have to do is observe your students and write down notes about what they are doing, how they are performing in class, etc., etc. Right? And at the end, uh, you can uh, assess them much better. You can make a test if you like, you're doing a form assessment, but then you will have more criteria if you do, or, um, for example, as I said, a direct observation in class, peer assessment, self-assessment on the side of students. So we, you, you will have a wider range of information to, to include in your assessment. And uh, using lots of clear activities, of course, this is the, the main aspect or the main point of, of this webinar, that is doing projects uh, having CLIL as the main, as the main, uh, or as the basis of, of our projects, all right? In fact, on the screen you have a poster of one of the projects of, uh, my, of uh, my Little CLIL World, right? I don't know if you're familiar with, with uh, My Little CLIL World. I'm going to show you. My Little CLIL World is an, uh, a new uh, method, because, because we cannot call this really a, a course book, it's a new method that Oxford University Press has edited this year for uh, infant education. And what is uh, the good thing about um, uh, this method? Well, one of the first things is that you have um, a lot of things already done, uh, already, a, lot, a lot of things, sorry, already done for you. So if you say that you sometimes lack time, uh, you don't have enough time to plan and prepare your lessons, uh, they have been already prepared for you, all right? Uh, you have even, he, here you have a poster of the main planning of a lesson uh, based on art and color, all right, which is clear content in which uh, different things are going to be uh, worked with, not only what is color and what, uh, how can you obtain colors, but where can you find colors in the world, what, uh, what can you do with the colors, and then you can also uh, find uh, references to different artists and how they use the color, etc. So a lot of content having to do with art in this, in this um, specific topic. Right, so you have lesson plans already uh, done for you. You have uh, a lot of uh, ideas and activities to carry out in class, and the student's books is the student's book. Sorry, is not the classical, typical course book because, as, as you know, as you see, as you can see, if I open it, 
you see that they well i i don't know if you can see it well the pages are completely blank all right well this is the the diploma the, the pages are blank why because through project work these are not the typical worksheets we are used to, but in these worksheets, the students are going to do many different things that previously are going to be worked throughout the project. So they are going to go building up this, uh, we could even call it a scrapbook, uh, in, uh, as, as the project goes on, right? It's not the typical worksheet to, to uh, fill up with uh, exercises and things like that. Here they have to put all the creativity in order to uh, make a whole page of the book okay right so critical thinking what does critical thinking refers to <clears throat> well critical thinking refers to the ability that human beings have of analyzing everything that is or uh, surrounds them all right uh, and do it in a in an objective in an objective way all right and reasoning what uh, we are analyzing that is is uh, using the brain. Critical thinking has to do, to do with using the brain. That is, when we uh, suggest an activity to be carried out in class, that activity or that task should demand from our students a lot of thinking to solve it. All right? And in order to solve it, children or students in general have to analyze what they have to do. They have to analyze it, taking into account all the prior knowledge and all the knowledge they have acquired throughout the sessions in class. And then they have to uh, make a judgment of how to perform or solve that task. And all that involves a lot of cognition in it. And that is critical thinking. Okay? So, when uh, doing critical thinking in, in class with your students, even with uh, pre-primary students, lots of different cogn cognitive aspects and skills have to be worked, like handling data, uh, stating different uh, facts or recalling facts, observing things, doing uh, research, etc., etc. Everything that has to do with cognition is closely linked to critical thinking. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the 21st century skills, and one of the first uh, or, or the most important ones that is uh, highlighted uh, amongst them is the uh, critical thinking, as you have there on the diagram on your right. That is, thinking skills used from a cognitive point of view from a, a deep cognitive point of view, all right? So critical thinking is going to be one of the four pillars uh, upon which we build up uh, or, 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 this, or the 21st century still skill, sorry, stand. The other one is collaboration. Collaboration in, in project work is going to be absolutely vital. And in clear project work, probably most important. Why? Because as regards learning content in a different language from the mother tongue, all students start from scratch. That is, maybe you can have different levels of English in your class, right? Some students uh, whose level of English is higher than the others, etc. But as regards learning new content in English, all of them will start from scratch because probably none of them have, have uh, out of the outside of the school, probably none of them have ever been in contact with a science content in English or social science content in English because even if they go to private lessons or academies, it clearly is not taught out in academies. CLIL is taught in schools, right? So as regards learning new content in a foreign language, everybody starts from the same point. And this is why they are going to cooperate and collaborate a lot because students who are stronger in the language or who master the language more than others can be the helper the helpers of these other children who are weaker, who are weaker with the language. But, and also you can have probably some students who are stronger in science, but whose level of English is not that good. So those stronger students in science can help those other students who are not that strong in science. So a lot of cooperation uh, through pair work, teamwork, small groups, etc., is going to be required, which again, we are uh, attaining another of the 21st century uh, aims. The other one is communication, all right? The language of learning, language for learning, and language through learning, which is the kind of language that we need to understand the cognitive, sorry, the, the academic language that uh, CLIL involves, because in CLIL, since we work through content, either in social sciences, history, geography, uh, mathematics, arts, etc., the kind of vocabulary and structures that is used there, 
is academic, is not the kind of vocabulary and structures that you usually use in your daily conversation with another person in English, right? So they have to master that language too, all right? So this is the language of learning for learning and for learning, and for learning which we have seen in, in previous seminars as well, or webinars as well. And the other one, and, oh, and of course, in CLIL projects, communica uh, communication is going to be vital because uh, children or students need to communicate both with the, with the teacher and with the rest of classmates in order to fulfill and perform the project, okay? Because the project is going to be a whole class project. So everybody must contribute in some way or the other to fulfill the project. And the fourth pillar of the 21st century skills is the creativity. That is, creativity has to do not only with art, but it has to do with cognition. That is, being creative uh, at the moment they have to look for solutions to solve a problem. They have to create, they have to think creatively, they have to think, to put a lot of cognition in order to be able to solve a problem, all right? So that is uh, what creativity means in order, in uh, regarding, sorry, project work. So critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. Sorry, let me see, uh, read what you're saying here. What I do is just not clear, okay. Is this different than the other C's, content, cognition, communication, and culture? It looks really interesting, more, more engaging. Well, this is, we could say that this is complementary to Doug Coyle's four C's, okay? Because here we keep communication, but these are uh, the 21st century skills that have been uh, established for the new generation. That is, the new generation should base on critical thinking, collaborating, communication, and create creativity, especially in a technological world in, uh, in which a lot of different uh, problems require a lot of cognition to be solved. Okay? So we could say that the 21st century skills are the, the, the complementary uh, C's to, to Doc Coyle's four C's, which are the clear ones. Okay, the 21st century skills have to do with all subjects and with all um, aspects of life, not only with uh, not only with CLIL. Okay, right. <clears throat> so um, remember that we are talking about CLIL. So in CLIL, as you all know, uh, what we do is is a, a, a dual. A approach in which both content and language are worked at the same time and the ideal thing to do would be to do it integratedly that is integrating the language and the content and the content and the language in the same session right so that means that when we plan the activities and tasks in our projects right we have to bear in mind that we have to include cognition and not only the four linguistic skills speaking reading listening and writing those are necessary to develop the linguistic skills. But when we talk about learning content or dealing with other content that is not linguistic, like the history content, the chemistry content, or the social sciences content or science content, remember that that content is going to require cognition, not only speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Children or students will have to do something else with that content. And the things they have to do with it is uh, working cognitively with them from different points of view. Okay. Right. So, and uh, people can ask me, how, how can you foster creative thinking in pre-primary school? I mean, in pre-primary level where your students are almost beginning their, their school life, all right? Well, uh, probably with more guidance uh, on the side of the teacher, but it is absolutely possible and very, very positive, all right? Because the sooner you begin uh, working cognitively with your students and um, uh, helping them to become more and more creative, the better will be for the future, all right? Not only for the school future, but for the future life in general. So, how can we foster these uh, skills? First, promote independent thinking. Personal autonomy and reason judgment. What does this mean? That what does it mean that we have to give them a little bit more freedom? We have to uh, let them make mistakes. We have to let them fall down and, and get up again and uh, retake from the moment they were doing. So that is, we have to let them be autonomous, not being. Uh, like helicopters all around the children all the time. From time to time we have to just leave them, go around the classroom monitoring other groups or whatever, and then just we were monitoring, however, 
but we have to give them some freedom to do the things the way they prefer. Not wanting to, uh, as sometimes teachers do, wanting to have everything perfect, the final product perfect, or a, a perfect uh, for performance of something that they are going to produce. They have to do it their way, okay? And that is the only way they are going to learn how to improve it little by little. If someone makes something that is not that brilliant, or that is not that neat or clear, you can tell them, oh, this is very nice, that's fantastic. But maybe next time you can just make a little more of effort and present it in a different way, but it is their the work. So you can guide them, you can give them ideas of how to do it, but the final product is theirs, all right? So let them be autonomous. Don't be just uh, on them all the time, okay? That is very, very important. Uh, Gino says that labeling matching activities may help to recognize vocabulary and so forth. Yes, we are going to see some ideas uh, later on, Gino. So, and, and of course, recent judgment, that is, when you ask them a question, we, we have to try to ask them a, what I call creative questions. That is, questions that make them think. Uh, if you ask a child, is this, um, I don't know, is this, is this green or blue? This is not creative at all, because they, they already seen that this is gr uh, green, okay? So, creative questions mean questions that make them think. They have to look for a solution for the question, for, a, for a, an answer for the question. But to answer the question, they, they need to put some cognition in it, all right? So, and they have to be able to answer, to give you a recent answer of why they are, question, uh, they are answering that. Okay, if I ask you, for example, why do you think that plants can grow with no water? All right, they will have to look for an answer for that, and then they have to reason it and, and, and explain why, the reason why, not just say, for example, yes, I know that in my house there are some plants that don't need water. The name, it, probably they don't know, cacti, right, and why don't they need water or a lot of water to live? So they, they, should, be ne they should be able to answer those questions and to justify the, the, the answers. And for that, working through projects, they will find a lot of different answers to uh, answer critically and to answer uh, cognitive, uh, sorry, um, creatively to your questions. <clears throat> Critical thinking involves logic, didactive reasoning, analysis, and creative ways of uh, problem solving. So, when once your students are in front of a problem, when they, face, they, they have to face a problem, a problem can be a task that you pose to them or that you, you present them, uh, which they have to, to perform or to fulfill or to do, they, little by little, they have to learn to be logic when uh, facing the task. That is, thinking about first, looking at what they have in front of them, analyzing, recall all the prior knowledge and information they have about the, what is going to be involved in the task, all the things that have been worked in class previously, all right, and then they have to be logic in order to, uh, to, to apply all that information and all, those co uh, and all that cognition into solving the problem or the task, okay? And if they can do it in creative ways, much the better. If we let our students, they will show us how creative they can be. In fact, these days that we are working uh, with them through uh, or via computers, sometimes some of my kids say, I'm getting bored, and I say, getting bored is really good. And some of them, my kids are six-year-olds, and some of them told me, yes, it's very good because when you get bored, you have to think about how can you do not to get bored. And that's the, that's the thing, all right? So we need them to be creative and to put all, the, the, all that creativity in what they do. Even if you are not uh, very um, conform with, uh, with, the, with the kind, they put the creativity on what they are doing, but it, at, at the end of the day, it's their creativity and it's their learning process. So we need to, lead, to, to give them this freedom to express creatively in the things they do. Okay? Another aspect of critical thinking is that uh, if you're familiar with Bloom's, with Bloom's taxonomy that we're going to see in a moment, Bloom's taxonomy has six different st uh, steps or th six different levels as regards uh, thinking. We have, at the base of the pyramid, we have a low-order thinking skills, that is, thinking skills that don't require a lot of cognition, 
And then we have the higher order thinking skills, which are skills that re uh, require a lot of cognition. So when we work through projects with, uh, with children or with students, even very young learners, we have to bear in mind that working lots is okay, but we cannot stop in there. We have to go ahead or up on the pyramid until we reach uh, the higher levels of uh, cognition and thinking. And one of the problems of uh, many ed education systems is that usually we or they stop, uh, not we. We I say we because we are forced to do it because of the of the of the uh, laws or of the curriculums we have. But sometimes teachers just stop on the two first levels that is lower thinking skills and they forget about the most important ones which are the higher the thinking skills. So this is why we don't have sometimes creative students or students who are able to uh, to look for uh, effective solutions to, to solve a problem etc. Okie dokie. So here you are Bloom's taxonomy's uh, pyramid. As I told you, the two levels which are in, 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 in the cold colors, that is purple and blue, remember and understand, those are the lower thinking skills, all right? And the problem is that sometimes, especially when you do formal assessment, as Gino said before, is that usually you stopped on those levels. That is, on, in a test, what do, you, what do you ask your students to do the majority of the time? To remember the things that they have learned and then write them on the text or answer them on the text. And then if they can explain them a little bit to, to show you, to demonstrate you that they have understood it, much the better. But sometimes we stop in there, all right? And in some lessons we also do. What would be the, de the desirable thing to do? To go up on the pyramid until we are able to work with the students and to promote it in the students the idea of applying, analyzing, evaluating and creating different things in class, all right? So at the top of the pyramid would be the creative uh, aspect, uh, which would be the most important one, because that is really what, where students are going to work with the competencies, right? When they are creative is because they are competent enough in many different things, mathematics, um, uh, social science, natural sciences, I mean science in general, ICTs, in arts or whatever, they are going to be competent enough to be able to create something Sometimes with a little bit of help, and some of the times completely autonomously, which uh, would be the, the desirable thing to do. Okay, so uh, do you take hots and lots in, uh, into account when, when you plan your lessons, when you plan your projects? Have you ever stopped to think about, mm, I think this is too much of remembering and understanding, and children don't really have to do any analyzing or any applying here? Let's see because someone's typing. Because sometimes we completely forget about this, and this is something we have to bear in mind when planning project. Because project work, okay, most of the time you do, Jessica, right? Project work fosters uh, and triggers for this uh, kind of critical thinking, all right? And, and uh, puts the students into the situation of having to face a problem and to solve it. Right, so great, Jessica. Okay, let's go to uh, little by little to see some examples of activities you can do in class with your students, right, when uh, uh, doing project work. It takes a long time to go from lots to hot. I know, but little by little we have to. So lo uh, lots and hot, you, uh, as regards lots, probably you can work them a lot on the first, on the first month of the year. But later, uh, little by little, you have to go up. Uh, the pyramid and try to, and the, the most interesting thing would be to integrate them. So this is why project work is very uh, useful for uh, working uh, critical thinking and, and, and the different hots and lots, because in project work all the time students are doing and uh, putting a lot of cognition in what they do. So they are all the time analyzing that data, handling data, uh, taking data from one uh, support to a different one, they, they have to contrast, they have to compare, they have to evaluate that data in order to create something at the end. So this is why project work is very uh, good to... You must be patient. Yeah, I know, I know. That, that is one of the problems we sometimes we teachers have, patience. But we need out of patience. Uh, and, uh, and what is very important uh, regarding project work is that once your students get used to project work and, and working cooperatively and, and, and collaboratively, uh, they will never ever 
go back to to a the typical course book sitting down one by one and they will be more in empathy uh, uh, they, they will have more empathy with the with the classmate they will understand how to respect everybody's ideas and turns and contributions etc etc okay uh, so you mean they develop those skills without realizing and it takes them time to show it yeah absolutely they, we are there just to help them uh, make all these uh, all these skills uh, raise up all right but you cannot do it on purpose. That is, you cannot take, uh, say to a child, okay, now I'm going to make you uh, understand uh, or I'm going to make you analyze or evaluate this. You have to teach them or to show them how to do it little by little. But it is something that it is, it is uh, intrinsical, okay? Extrinsically, we can give them some uh, tips, uh, recommendations, tools, help them, guide them. But uh, analyzing is something that is intrinsical. We can, we can teach, it, teach them how to analyze something, but at the end of the day, it is them who have to analyze the things. Okay, what we can do is scaffold all this project from going to lots uh, into hots, right? Scaffold it uh, by, by offering different kinds of activities that take them from one uh, of, the, of the pyramid steps uh, or stages to the other. We are going to see some examples now, right? So, for example, let's begin with lots, with understanding the basis of the pyramid. For example, one activity you can do in lots is, as uh, Francis says before, said before, labeling things. All right, that is, here we have a project that we did uh, about the Graffalo. Imagine that can be the project of the Graffalo, the project of the colors. Uh, we have seen it before, the, the project about plants or the body or the water cycle, whatever. And uh, they have, you have to present them with a, a blank picture of the topic you are working with and they have to label it. That is, the, you, you prepare the labels and what they have to do is just read what is on the labels and put them on the correct place. Here they are showing you that they understand what they have been working in class before. Okay? I, as you can see, I have skipped uh, remembering because remembering is the most typical one, uh, lower thinking skill that we do in class because most of the time we are asking students and the questions we ask them is just to see and to check if they remember the things we have worked. Okay, but remembering doesn't mean that they understand. Sometimes children, especially those who are based or who are teachers based strictly on course book to the letter and they memorize things, sometimes they memorize things, they can remember them but they don't understand what they are memorizing. Okay, so one example here, for example as regards understanding. Another example, uh, here uh, the students have, uh, are classifying plants, different plants, the different parts of plants weeds. Okay, this is another project that you can do with your students and here is an activity in which they have different plants and they have to classify it into uh, the ones that weed the stem from or with the leaves or with the seeds or the, or the fruit, etc, etc. So again, after having worked this in class before uh, through the project, mm -hmm. they have to reflect it, all right, mm -hmm. and they have to show us that they have understood what has been learned in class. Now, locating things, for example. Here, children, am I, uh, this girl is uh, locating uh, something on a map. Specifically, she's, specifically sorry, she's locating uh, opera theatres on, on a world map. Okay, so apart from knowing where the different theatres are, they have to look for uh, the points, the specific points in the map where these places are. So we have uh, worked, because this is a project we did on Opera in class, so we have worked previously on all, all these theatres and where uh, the cities uh, these, the these theatres were located at, and then we have to look for those cities in the map. So again, we are transferring data uh, from paper, all right, in this case to a map, all right? So this uh, trans transferring is a uh, part of critical thinking because it's a cognitive skills. All right, applying. Let's move one step forward or one step up. In this case, this uh, we were working on plants, all right, a typical science project, and after, uh, after having worked on these, uh, these children had on the table um, different parts of a plant, all right? They, as, you, as you have them, as, as you can see some of them on the table, they were all scattered around because it was, was, it was like a puzzle, okay? So I asked them in the small, in the small group, they, they, we did this activity in small groups, uh, 
we had to, or they had, sorry, to make the puzzle with all the different parts of the plant, including the, 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 the pot, the plant pot, and then they have to label the different parts of the plant. How did they have to label them? By heart. Children who already knew them, yes, but some others asked for some help. So instead of me telling them how to spell them correctly or to give them a worksheet with the, with the different um, information for the spelling, I told them, okay, you know we have a book about plants, go get a book and you look for the information in the book. So they have to, they have to be autonomous in solving that problem. And what they did was go and take the book, and on the book they looked for the different information about the different parts of the plant, and then with some magnetic letters they built up the different parts of the plant uh, with the correct spelling. All right, so they were applying all the prior knowledge they acquired in class, because to do this they need to know that the flower is the flower, the stem is the stem, and the leaves are the leaves. And then, once they saw the, 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 the different words in the book, they have to build them up next to uh, the different parts of the puzzle. Applying. Okay, you have seen all the cycle, the life cycle of a plant. Uh, we have to apply that knowledge into a real uh, activity. We need to grow up. I don't know, I, I, I think it was a potato, yes, because now I remember that it was uh, over three meters long at the end of the experiment. So, we planted a potato, right? So, we have seen previously in class that uh, the, what the plants need to, to grow healthy, that is, they need soil, water, they need uh, temperature, they need light. So, we were, we were going to apply, with through an experiment, a hands-on experiment, all the knowledge that they have acquired in class. So again, who is making it? The teacher? No. Let them do it. If anybody of them uh, forgot at the end of, because everybody planted one, one potato, right? Uh, if any, uh, anybody uh, didn't remember the steps and they forgot, for example, to put the soil or to cover the potato with soil, or they forgot to put some water on the plants, it was a mistake. So we would see what happens later on, and that lets us reflect on the uh, mistakes or the errors uh, we committed or we made when doing it. Okay, so they apply the knowledge, but it, it is them who are doing that, and they reflect on what they have done previously. And here also they are applying uh, some knowledge regarding colors, all right? So they have there, they are working in pairs, as you can see, and what uh, this is another project we did, and here we were uh, working with colors and patterns, and what they had to do was uh, from the from the pictures they had in there, they have to label them correctly by reading a language chunk. It was not a full sentence because these kids are six year old, but they, they it is a language chunk, uh, and they have to apply all the knowledge they had about the different aspects we have worked in class and the different pictures they have in there, and also their their personal experience. For example, there is an elephant, so the personal experience tells them that elephant is color gray, for example, right? Here, another uh, example of applying has to do with uh, science, for example. So here we were working on the different parts of, and what they did was applying all the knowledge we have done uh, or we have uh, learned in class before to solve that problem. The problem was that they have a real apple, so they have to cut it in halves and uh, identify in the real apple the parts that we have seen previously in class, both in pictures and in words. All right. So again, transferring different kind of data from pictures to a three-dimensional object, which is apple, and being able to identify the parts that we have worked in class. In class, so they have to apply the knowledge in order to fulfill the task of uh, finding those parts in a real fruit in the apple. And here, another uh, activity for for applying the, the prior knowledge was on dinosaurs. So. We've learned about, about dinosaurs, we learned about, or, or we've worked, sorry, about uh, the different parts of, of the dinosaur skeletons. We, we have been, we, uh, we did an activity as being paleontologists and having to dig for dinosaur skeletons, etc. So now it was the time to see, to apply the knowledge about the uh, shape 
the full shape of a dinosaur skeleton. So the idea was to give them different skeleton parts in this order, and they had to put them or ensemble them together, and then afterwards labeling them. All right. So there they have to apply the prior knowledge uh, of the things we have done in class with the, the, the skeletons of dinosaurs or dinosaur skeletons. Right. Next step, analyzing. For example, after we did the activity of the puzzling class in which they have to label the plants, do you remember? When we went outside to the playground, uh, I'm afraid our play playground is a typical playground in a, in a urban school, so it's concrete playground. But we are lucky enough to have just a little bit of, uh, which is half a meter probably, of soil and plants, some plants in there which are mainly bushes, right? But so there are some small weeds also. So we went outside, and what they did was take it into in uh, or taking advantage uh, that uh, that there were many weeds. I gave them permission to just uh, tear the weeds up because you know that the weeds are not good for for the rest of the of the bushes and plants uh, growing. And I told them to do it carefully so to see if we could uh, tear them up. And uh, or pull them up, sorry, and if we, if we were able to see the to see the um, roots of the plant. Okay, so that is the, uh, what this group is doing. They have a register uh, worksheet, all right, and on the worksheet they were going to register different things. I asked them for living things, non living things, different parts of the plants, etc. That we have worked in class before. So here they were analyzing in a real plant if everything they have seen in class matched. Uh, this this real plan that is what we saw in the puzzles in pictures etc. Uh, here another way, way of analyzing that had to do with uh, different breads in the world. We have worked to do, uh, work with this in class, and now they have to uh, have a look and uh, to a, to a map, all right, and in a in a personal map that is uh, we have a big map on the on the blackboard and then everybody had an, indi an individual map so what they had to do was reflect on their individual map the different countries uh, that, that are written on the on the blackboard which are uh, the ones the breads we tasted in class uh, came from all right because we tasted bagels and naans and and pita bread all right different things uh, mexican tortillas etc so Again, here they have to go, first they have to go to the big map, they have to look for the correct countries, analyze where they are, and then reflect that on their map, okay, which is uh, something a little bit difficult for six-year-olds, but again, if you train them how to do this, and you help them how to do this, little by little, they, they uh, because for example, here in this analysis process, some of the children say, no, but this country is over here, and they, and some others came and say, no, but listen, look at the shape, look at the, at the, at the ties, this is very small, uh, the one you're pointing to is very small, this one is bigger, so they were analyzing uh, the two maps in order to uh, reflect or to solve the problem that was finding the different countries the breads came from. And here we have another activity of, uh, of analysis, right, in which students are weighing a potato, because it was a project we did on potatoes, and one of the things we have to do in maths was working uh, measures, right? So they measured uh, the potatoes, bo both weighing them and, and uh, measuring them with a ruler to see how long they were, all right? And then they made an, a, a contrast uh, and a comparison between uh, different kinds of uh, or the different sizes of potatoes, they have to put them in order, explain why, why, why they thought what, one was heavier than the other, etc., etc. So make an analysis of, uh, of, the, of the measurement they were doing at the moment. So as you see, a lot of um, very practical and hands-on activities uh, that are part of the project, and of course, before these activities, we did some others uh, to be, uh, for the students to be able to, to do this uh, these cognitive uh, skills autonomously and with a little bit of a guidance on my on my side. Here we you have, for example, another example of analyzing. In this case, is the language. Here we're working with uh, with uh, uh, or we're working sentence level work. So here, what I've got is uh, small cards with different words on them. And uh, as you can see, uh, the cards have different colors. So the ones that are color white are uh, uh, nouns or adjectives. My students don't know that this is a noun. They know what, what is a noun, but uh, not adjectives. We call them characteristics. 
and the blue ones are the actions, all right? I, we don't talk about verbs, but actions. So they have to build up sentences, full sentences, using the, the, the words they have in there. So here, in order to create a sentence, a sentence and build a sentence, they have to analyze the different parts that, uh, that uh, form the sentence, and they also have to analyze in what order do the different words appear in the sentence. All right, so a lot, a lot of cognition is put in there in an activity that can look very easy for us, but uh, is quite complex for a six-year-old. Right, more analysis here. As uh, I said before about the, uh, <coughs> sorry, the dinosaur skeletons. Here we were acting as uh, paleontologists, so they have to dig for dinosaurs, and then since we have worked about dinosaurs, uh, plant eaters, meat eaters, the characteristics of plant, meat, plant eaters and meat eaters, that is herbivores and carnivores, uh, and we worked on the skeleton of the dinosaur, as you saw before in the face before, now, by looking with a, with a magnifying glass to the uh, dinosaur's skeleton, well, they can see the dinosaur's skeleton perfectly well. The magnifying glass was to put a more uh, dramatic thing on the, on, the, on the game, on the play, right? So they have to examine their, the, the skeletons and through the characteristics of the skeleton they have to tell me if that dinosaur would have been a plant eater, a herbivore or a carnivore. All right? So that again they have to analyze all the characteristics of the skeleton and then recall the prior knowledge and apply it to tell me uh, thanks to the characteristics if they had claws, a big teeth, uh, if they had long long legs and short arms, etc., if they were uh, carnivores and herbivores. More analysis, timelines, for example. This is another thing that we work a lot. That is, being able to analyze pictures, all right, and to put them chronologically, uh, taking into account different aspects. For example, in this case, these pictures have to do with bread. So, uh, what you have to do is um, find Pictures that are very clearly from for, or, or that are very, or belong very clearly to very different uh, ages of time. All right. So there were some pictures of uh, Egyptians, for example, from the Middle Ages, from the modern area, from the mo modern ages, sorry, from the medieval ages, and from the from the modern uh, age. All right. So by looking at them and contrasting them and analyzing them, uh, I especially told students have a look, especially at the clothes they are wearing. All right, and also if there are some kind of buildings to the buildings that appear there, so you can contrast that and analyze them, uh, contrasting them with uh, the actual uh, clothes and actual um, buildings, so you will see the difference. And little by little, we build up the the timeline. So timelines are a very good way of analyzing uh, uh, content too. And here in the in one of the projects we did about recycling. Again, here they had different cards, different cards with many different things, and they have to analyze where those cards could go, all right, depending on the different bin. So we had uh, five different bins, depending on plastic, what the three typical ones, plastic, uh, normal trash, and, uh, and um, paper, right? But we also included another one for, electro uh, for electronic uh, uh, devices, for example, and another one for clothes. All right. So depending on what was on the picture, they have to classify them, and they have to give an answer and justify the answer why they thought they they could put it in in one or the other bin. Right here, another way of analyzing is using a realia. That is a real materials. Right. So as you see, this girl is uh, handling a, a puzzle, a, a wooden puzzle of a, a leaf. All right. But after handling them and, and having learned about the different uh, names of the blade, the veins, the pecial, the stipule, etc., we went out in the playground, and this uh, activity we always do it in, in the autumn. So we picked up, or they picked up some, some leaves, and I told them, now what I want you to do is to find out in this leaf the parts that we have seen in class before with the puzzle, and you have to cut out the leaf into the different parts, all right? So they, first, they have to analyze all the parts uh, from the wooden leaf, so they have to take out part by part, identify them with a, with a real leaf, and they take the scissors and cut out the different parts of the leaf. So as you see here, 
this girl is comparing, making some analysis between uh, the, the nerves, for example, of the leaves or the veins and the and the blade, for example, and she has labeled the pecio, the pecio, the pecial and the stipules, etc. Okay. So very uh, hands-on activities and very experimental ones. Here another way of analyzing, instead of using a typical map as we had on the on the blackboard before, having a, a, a two-dimension map in which they can take out uh, uh, the different continents and they have to match the continent on the map to a continent on the on a, on a card and then label it correctly. Okay, so they have to analyze the shape of the continents, in this case also the color of the continents because they coincided, and see if the shape, the the size, etc., match it the one uh, match the one on the on the card and label them. Right, as regards the next step, evaluating. Uh, you can do a lot of evaluation through experiments, especially. All right, so here in this group, these children are doing an experiment. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Uh, it's the celery experiment in which you put a celery stick on some dyed water, and every five minutes, more or less, you cut out a little piece of the celery stick, and you and, and children observe how the the, the vessels, the, the the you know that when you cut out a celery stick, it has this shape more or less, right? And so all through here, there are the different vessels, the vegetal vessels, through which the celery absorbs the water. Even if the celery is not in the soil anymore, it continues absorbing the water because it, it, the celery has a, 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 a great quantity of water. So they observe how the little, the little dots uh, that correspond to the vessels are dyed in color red. Okay, and, and then they put it uh, other five minutes and they go cutting out different uh, parts of the celery until it comes to the top and they observe how the plant con absorbs the water throughout the vessels. And they have to evaluate that and register it on a, on a worksheet, okay, on a register sheet. Another way of evaluating, for example, is sequencing, that, that is, giving students something to sequence, okay? Like, for example, here, part of a, the part of a story. This was a story about uh, the growth of, uh, of wheat, and what they uh, have to do is I gave them the, the, different, the different, different pictures corresponding to this story, and they have to evaluate, analyze, also analyze, remember, that is, all the previous one, and then evaluate which uh, was the correct order to present and sequence them. And then they had to present it to the rest of the class, telling us the reasons why they thought uh, the pictures were in that order and not in another one. All right? Here, another way of evaluating, tasting. The best way to evaluate, to judge something, is to make it or taste it or hear it or smell it. Okay? So this was a project about bread. So they have to evaluate here uh, the different kinds of bread they were tasting. Uh, and also give me um, feedback about the different textures, the different uh, taste, the different sensations uh, they have when, when tasting them, etc. And at the end, they had to evaluate and judge uh, what was the, class, uh, the class's favorite bread. First, individually, they independently, individually, sorry, they have to tell me what was their favorite bread. So in order to be able to tell them and evaluate, judge, all of them uh, regarding many different aspects, as I told you, texture, uh, the, the smell, the taste, etc. And at the end, we did a, a class chart, uh, a bar chart, and we uh, got which was the, the, the class favorite. Uh, here, another way, another way of evaluating having to do with art. Uh, what children are doing here is sketching uh, something that they are going to paint later on. Okay? Again, this is something we did with the project of uh, plants. And uh, we worked on Archimboldo. I don't know if you're familiar with Archimboldo. He was a Renaissance, uh, Renaissance um, Italian uh, painter who used flowers, vegetables, and, and fruits in order to create his, uh, his works. Okay. So uh, we were going to paint something as in the Archimboldo way. But before that, I told them that uh, all the artists, before creating their, their works, they, they sketched them. Okay, and to sketch them, the best way to do it was uh, with uh, what Archimboldo used, real fruits and vegetables. So they are evaluating the different possibilities of those vegetables and fruits in order to create a portrait. 
okay? So before doing, making physically the portrait painting, they have to evaluate all the possibilities they had on the table in order to create the portrait, and they did. Here, uh, they are evaluating, as I told you before, me the measuring uh, potatoes, and they are, uh, they are evaluating the differences between ones and others. They have a big potato, or a, a, a bigger and smaller, and a medium-sized potato, right? So they have to uh, measure the centimeters and evaluate later on uh, which was the, big, the longest, the shortest, and, and present it to class, and register it on the register sheet you have there. Here, they are evaluating, again, data on a... On a on a bar chart, instead of presenting it on paper, we made this physically this bar chart with linking cubes, all right? So uh, to the answers that we got in class, different linking cubes were uh, put in there on the chart, and at the end they have to evaluate the results, okay? So they are doing statistics in, in infant education. Another way of evaluating, evaluating is judging or deciding, right? So here you are, uh, the two typical experiments, experiments magnetic, non-magnetic, uh, sink float, all right? With um, real objects that we had in a classroom, uh, they have to uh, make the experiment and evaluate at the end which one were uh, or, or uh, belong to one uh, characteristic or the other. And here, uh, you have two different games also to evaluate. Uh, the one on the right is about transport. So they have three pictures of uh, air, water, and land. And with all those uh, little transport toys they have in there, they have to evaluate and to decide uh, which one belongs to what media, okay? And uh, on the other one, what you have is uh, races, different races of the world, all right? So they have the, these little uh, toys in there, these little uh, dolls, wooden dolls, and depending on the characteristic of the dolls they saw on the, on the pictures and remembering uh, all the information we have uh, worked or, the, or they have acquired in class about uh, the world, the continents, and the different races, uh, they have to locate them uh, on the different parts of the world. And finally, we reach the step of creating. That is, before getting here, all the rest of the uh, steps we have seen are necessary. So here you have uh, my kids doing different kinds of creation. Like, for example, on the right on the left button, you have uh, them uh, painting the Archimboldo way, so after they have made a sketch with the fruits and vegetables, they have to remember the, the, the portrait they have sketched and they have to represent it in there. So this is the one you saw before in the, in the picture with the broccoli on top and the banana as the, as the green smile. Then another girl is writing a letter, so they are creatively writing a letter to the class next door. These are some creations of the moon that they made, for example, with uh, recycled materials. The, mo most of these are the bottom parts of um, plastic cups and egg cartons, all right? And also there is some wire in there, and at the end uh, they stuck everything on, onto a piece of uh, card, and then uh, we sprayed it with, with uh, silver spray. So at the end we had like the moon craters in there. So different uh, ideas for creating, creative writing, for example, yeah, they, they, uh, they are writing a poster about Elmer, Elmer the elephant who, who's been lost, uh, and, and they display the posters around the school to see if anybody could uh, find Elmer, and they did. Elmer was in Quinto A, so in, in, in year 5A, so Elmer was brought back to class. And here you have more ideas of creating, for example, how to create on the dinosaurs project. A dinosaurs, uh, creatively and autonomously, with a simple foam uh, shapes, okay? So I put different baskets on the different groups with different uh, geometrical shapes, and they have to create different uh, dinosaurs. So as you see, some of them made typical ones with a long neck, others with spikes. This boy here on the right made, made a, a, a T-Rex standing, all right, not on four legs, as uh, all children did, etc. Right, as regards communication, uh, I said that it is very, very important, so it is something we have to uh, encourage from the very beginning. How to encourage communication in class? For example, uh, through the teacher being in front of them, asking them creative questions, as uh, you have the example there, I was asking them about letters, creative questions about letters, so I put in front of them an, an envelope uh, sealed and with a stamp, it was a stamped and sealed also, 
and uh, I was asking them questions, so they were communicating with me by answering these questions. And then the kind of communication I, I, I enjoy the most in class is the other three pictures in which children have to communicate in the small groups or in the pairs in order to solve the problems, right? For example, in the first one, they have to solve is a task in, this, in which they are doing a file for the game about do's and don'ts about the, the dental, uh, dental health. All right, so they have to look at the pictures and classify them. Then in the small group at the bottom, you have children uh, labeling the different parts of the apple, as we have seen before, and on the other picture, growing a bin in this little greenhouse. So they have to take a lot of, um, uh, they have to negotiate a lot, they have to um, communicate a lot in order to fulfill these tasks. All right, and as regards creativity, uh, you have here uh, how creative children can be. Uh, as, as you have there, creating dinosaurs from just some foam shapes. Uh, and here this boy is uh, giving me a, a very creative answer about how we can uh, divide uh, or split this water into two, making that is measurement into two, uh, making that exactly on, uh, it is, is perfectly uh, divided in two different containers and he was giving me the answer of look at the leaf, at the little uh, at the little lines that we have in this in this jar and so here it says 500 so if we divide 500 divides uh, in two so it will make and so he puts uh, the what he poured the water into two smaller ones and he um, made us see how uh, the water fitted uh, exactly on the two other on the two other jars all right Creativity having to do with colors, that is, we created colors by mixing up uh, dyed, uh, dyed water. So they, they have to discover what colors were obtained by putting some, uh, some drops of different coloring in, in, in other colored water. And the girls on the right are making a butter in class, okay? Uh, we put some, some cream in class, so they have to, I told them, okay, you need, we need some butter. What, we don't have any butter, so what can we do with that? We have learned in class beforehand that by uh, putting uh, milk in churns and, and shaking and shaking and shaking, we obtain the butter. So they started shaking it in the bottles. I created and invented a boogie for them. So they've been boogieing for about 10 minutes until the butter came out, okay? And collaboration, as I said before and you saw in all the pictures, is necessary, especially as regards learning content in a foreign language because everybody starts from scratch regarding that okay so they cooperate a lot in not only in games in class but also with me but also when they are in pairs to uh, carry out their their, their different uh, tasks i i present them all right so there you are right as i said before uh, in um, my little clear word, here you have some examples of the, of the activities that appear in the students' books. Uh, most of the time in, in project work, the kind of worksheets we do are not the typical worksheets in which children have to answer something and do some kind of exercise. They are very open because the possibilities of solving or completing that worksheet are almost infinite, right? Because depending on your students' uh, abilities, cognitive skills, and creativity, they can answer or they can put on, the, on that worksheet one thing or another, or create one kind of product or another. So this is why the worksheets are very open, all right, except the ones in the colors, for example, here, because they, they have to mix up the colors to obtain the ones that, that are correct. But look at the one in the Mondrian style, for example, which is completely white, blank, because children have to be creative to uh, register their, uh, the, the final word. Okay, so in this in this um, book, in this method, uh, my little world, you have a lot of hands-on activities, experiments, very little to read and write because uh, we are more interested in students uh, in the students' learning process than in the final product. Okay, and remember, first, remember to let children do things by their own, even if you want things perfectly. Uh, children are not that perfect, no, especially the younger they are, the, m the more unperfect they are going to be. But at the end of the day, it's going to be their personal work. So even if somebody makes something you are not very, or when you tell them, cut out carefully and they could write uh, in the middle of the paper, in the middle of the paper, just leave them, is the work, okay? So leave them 
do the work alone. Leave them be autonomous. Little by little, they will become more uh, skillful and, and, and they, more master, they will master uh, the different techniques better. Then, remember that they have to be the, the center of the, of the learning process. Okay, so as you saw in the pictures in there, my mission as a teacher was helping them, but most of the time that gives me uh, or allows me to take photographs because I'm going around the classroom just monitoring what they are doing, but they, are, they work very autonomously, right? Because it is them who have to learn. I give them the tools, I give them the resources, I guide them uh, and I help them when they need me, but it is them who have to be hands-on all the time. Let them make mistakes, because remember that mistakes are uh, or mistakes and even errors. You know the difference between mistake and error, right? Uh, because errors and mistakes are a natural, are, are something natural in the in the learning process. It's part of the learning process. So there is no problem in making mistakes or errors. And sometimes after a mistake or an error, you will remember things better for the rest of your life. As I hope, I suppose it happens to you. All right, so. Let them make mistakes. And what is more important, let them solve the mistake themselves, so the errors themselves. You can give them advice uh, and counseling them or uh, telling them ideas on how to do it, but let them solve the problem again and rethink about the mistake they have made and try to solve it on their own. And let them reflect about what they do. It is just not doing this because of, it, just because, all right? You have to do this, reflecting on what you're doing, and when you finish it, you have to come to me and explain me, especially how you have done it or how you have made it, because I'm more interested in the full uh, process than in the final project. And when they do that reflection, it is because they use using cognition. And above all, let them think by themselves. Don't, don't, don't give things... Uh, or don't be the kind of teacher who uh, tells thing, uh, tells uh, the answer or says the answers to students, and don't uh, don't give the, the things already done for students, because sometimes when we are tired or we have 25 children around, I know that sometimes they come to uh, to ask you a question and you say, okay, the answer is this, or yeah, you do it this way. We have to try to avoid that because we need them to think by themselves, and the only the, the only way to do it is by letting them think by themselves. Obviously, always guided by the teacher, but uh, if we want critical thinkers, it is them who have to be critical thinkers. All right? Okay.